In today's first reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah is basically describing the coming kingdom of God. And notice how he says the veil that separates people from God will be removed. There will be no more tears, no more crying. In other words, once we make it to heaven, we will be just totally fulfilled. And this is also symbolized by this, this uh, notice how he says, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine. So this feast, in other words, we will be fulfilled. We will have all that we want. All our desires will be fulfilled. This is definitely something to look forward to. And in today's gospel reading, this theme of feasting is continued, but our Lord in particular talks about a wedding feast, a wedding banquet. And very often the kingdom of God is com compared to a wedding banquet, and this is exactly what our Lord is, is doing. And notice how the king, who's going to have this wedding banquet for his son, invites many people to come, but they don't come. They make excuses. And even after they refuse, the king sends even more of his slaves telling the people to come, saying to them, look, everything is ready. The oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered. In other words, he's trying to entice them, trying to make them realize that it's to your benefit to your come. But still, they make excuses. They're too busy about their own personal things. One has to go to his farm and another has to take care of his business. And not only that, some of them seized the slaves, mistreated them, and even killed them. Now, of course, the king represents God the Father, and his son is Jesus Christ. And the wedding is the wedding of, of Christ with his bride, the church, and others with each one of us. And the slaves that are sent out are basically the preachers, and we could say the prophets of Old Testament times. And yes, the prophets were killed, and even today many people don't listen to the preachers. But notice how God wants his wedding banquet to be filled with people. And so in the end, he sends out his slaves and he says, invite everyone, everyone you can find, both the good and the bad. And the hall is filled. Now, what, what, how do we respond to this invitation of God? How do you and I respond? How should people respond to this invitation of God to his, his wedding banquet, to the wedding banquet of Christ? And of course, the answer is through faith. We respond with faith. We believe, but it's not enough just to believe. You know, it mentions in the scripture that the demons believe and tremble. In other words, their belief doesn't benefit them. So in other words, we need to put our belief into action. We need to practice our faith. We need to go to church on Sundays. We need to say our daily prayers. We need to avoid sin. We need to try to do good. We need to obey the commandments of God. And recall also St. James where he says, you know, faith without works is dead. So we must manifest our faith. We must practice our faith. And this is very, very important because notice as, as the parable goes on, our Lord points out that when the king came in, he noticed an individual there who was not wearing a, ready, a wedding robe. He wasn't wearing a wedding garment. In other words, he wasn't qualified to be there. And so he's kicked out. And so the question we ought to ask ourselves is, well, what, what is the symbolism of this wedding garment, this wedding robe? And am I wearing my wedding robe? And others, am I truly prepared as I should be to enter the kingdom of heaven? You know, I don't know when I'm going to die, so I need to be prepared today, right now. So we need to ponder on this, you know, what does is, what is this wedding robe symbolize? Well, the church fathers and commentators on the scripture point out that this wedding garment refers to acts of charity, and not just acts of charity, but the habit of charity. In other words, someone who has the habit of charity, they will be performing many acts of charity. And that's how we acquire a habit, through repetition, right? So if we have this, this habit of charity, we will manifest it towards God. In other words, we won't just be going through the motions of our faith, but we will be truly grateful for all that God has done for us. We will respond, you know, just be, not just because we're afraid of hell or, or because we fear God or his punishment, but rather we will respond with 
generosity, with gratitude, thanksgiving, and love, which is what we are called to do. And not only towards God, but we will manifest love towards our neighbor. Now, you and I, we might pat ourselves on the back and we might say, yeah, I practice charity to my family members, to my friends, and I give to charitable organizations like Share Life, or whenever there's a natural catastrophe, I, I contribute to that. And that's good. But isn't it true that there are many atheists out there who have no faith, who also do as much? And our Lord tells us that we, our piety needs to exceed that of the pagans, that of the, the atheists. In other words, we are required to have more. So in other words, is that enough to kind of say, well, okay, I'm wearing my wedding garment? Well, some would say, no, it's not enough. We need to do more. As Christians, we need to look for opportunities to manifest charity, to practice charity, to be at the service of others. When we are charitable, we tend to look outside of ourselves to look for those opportunities where we can help others, and we tend to give of ourselves, of our time, or of our resources. But the opposite of this is looking inside of ourselves, or just focusing on ourselves. In other words, being selfish. When we are selfish, we only care about ourselves, and we want everyone to serve us. And when they don't, we feel justified in getting angry or losing our cool or having resentment towards others. And when we are selfish, we don't look out of ourselves. And even if we do happen to come across people who may be in need, our tendency is just to turn a blind eye. And this is not good. Now, just a few weeks ago, we had the life chain. And we were all invited to participate in the life chain, and it's good to participate in the life chain. And it was just one hour of our time in the afternoon from 2 to 3 p.m. to witness to the sanctity of human life. And the pro-life issue from the Catholic perspective is extremely important. Um, not just because, you know, abortion is wrong, but um, even when it comes to, for example, voting, Right? So many people vote for politicians who, who are pro-abortion, and, and that's wrong. If there's an alternative candidate who's not as pro-abortion or is opposed to it, we, we should vote for that politician. And some people say, oh, well, you can't just base your voting on one issue, the pro-life issue. Now, it's true there are many other issues, but that is the most important issue. It's the number one issue. Why? Because every human being deserves to be respected from the very first moment of conception until natural death. But many of these politicians are pushing abortion, but they're also pushing euthanasia. In other words, they're killing human beings. They don't care about human beings. What they're saying is human beings are expendable. So yes, they, there may be other issues. They may give you know, funding for this or, or subsidies for this or that, and people might think, well, that's great but they're really just trying to win your wo votes in, in many occasions. And as they don't really care about you because for them, life is cheap. And this is why the pro-life issue is the number one issue, the most important issue. So in other words, as Catholics, this is something we should be very concerned about. And if there is any opportunity for us to fight against evils in society, such as against abortion, we should take advantage of that opportunity. And recall how I mentioned that it's not just, you know, the, ch the innocent child in the womb, but many women who've had an abortion suffer terribly. In fact, just recently, a woman uh, at Planned Parenthood died going through an abortion. You know, and this is like we have modern technology and instruments and all these things. So even today, women die on the operating. Sometimes they have physical complications. Sometimes they're not able to have children afterwards because they've had an abortion. And many women suffer psychological, spiritual problems also as a result of it. So abortion harms women. So we're speaking out not just for the unborn, but for, for women to truly protect women and, and to truly support them and to make them realize that there are other alternatives. So this is such an important issue, but Many did not come out. So last year we had around 113 people come out. This year we had about 175 people. So our numbers are up, which is good. But even that number, it's only like, it's less than 10% 
of our parishioners. So where were the other 90% of people? Now, okay, granted, some people, they had valid excuses. Maybe they just couldn't come for whatever reason. But that's probably a small percentage. Let's say it's even as big as 10% of people. How about the other 80% of people? In other words, they were being invited for this very important witness to the sanctity of human life. In other words, they were being invited to work in our Father's vineyard. But they didn't come. They were like the individuals in today's gospel reading who made excuses. Oh, I got to do this. I got to go do that. In other words, they didn't see it as an important thing. They didn't realize that there is this great need for them to be present to witness. Now, okay, granted you didn't show up, but I also mentioned, you know, pray for the success of the life chain. Did you pray for the success of the life chain? How much did you pray for the success of the life chain? In other words, do you really care? Do you really have the virtue of charity? Do you really have the habit of charity? Are you really wearing the wedding garment that is required to enter into the kingdom of heaven? This is a serious question and something that we need to consider. Now imagine, imagine if everybody was out there, our witness would be much greater. Imagine if everybody made the effort to live as God calls us to live. If everybody really and genuinely stro strove to avoid, uh, you know, committing sins and to practice their faith. If everybody was doing that, it would be easier for everybody else to be doing the same things. But it's kind of like, well, there's pressure from the media or their peers. And, and you know, on one hand, we, we have our Catholic life. And on the other hand, we live in the world. Well, no. Are we Christians or are we worldly people? So we have to make that choice. But imagine a world where everybody was truly Christian and genuinely cared about others. Well, there would be far fewer poor people. They would be taken care of. There would be less homeless people. Everybody would be taken care of. People wouldn't be engaging in premarital sex. They wouldn't be getting married, or they wouldn't be having, um, wouldn't be getting pregnant and have, resorting to abortion as, as a solution to their problems, right? But imagine even in that kind of situation where everybody is truly Christian and full of love for each other. Imagine, okay, somebody does get pregnant outside of wedlock. Well, we wouldn't shame that person or put that person down. We would support that person. We would encourage that person to, you know, continue with their studies. And we would help them to, you know, to have their child and to take care of their child. Or if they couldn't keep their child for whatever reason, we would, you know, suggest that they give it up for adoption. And in fact, there are many Catholic agencies that do all these things right now. It's just people aren't aware of it. But it would be a wonderful world. Everybody would be full of love for everyone. Well, this is what God is calling us to do. And this is what God is saying that we as Christians must do. This is our duty. It's not just about our prayers and coming to church and receiving communion. That's just one aspect of our faith. We need to practice charity towards God, first and foremost, yes. Secondly, towards our neighbor, especially the most innocent, the most vulnerable, those within the womb. Let us consider who we are going to serve, whether we are going to follow the ways of the world or the ways of God.